Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I'm in one of those uh, in betweeny states just now, not quite sure whether I'm, uh, whether I'm coming or going. Although, of course, I'm going. You know, we're all going. That makes me think, uh, we might as well just dive right into this week's show. My guest this time is Christian Wyman, who has a phenomenal new book out right now. It's called Zero at the Bone, 50 Entries Against Despair. It's from Farrar strauss Garo uh, FSG. And it is not easy to describe. It's a uh, combination of poetry, personal essay and, and memoir, other people's poetry and, and quotes, kind of like a commonplace book. And, um, and well, uh, a kind of synthesis or, or alchemy of some sort. I mean, what it is, is an exploration of despair and the ways in which art, especially poetry, acts against despair. And I don't mean, you know, it cheers you up. I mean, Christian's getting at the ways in which poetry transforms the world, or maybe transmits it to the, the, the reader and, and to the poet. And, and in the process brings us closer to um, maybe God, depending on how you define the term. We do talk about joy as as sort of the opposite of despair. And uh, it reminds me, I once started a podcast uh, with the artist Jim Woodring uh, by asking him, well, let's start with something simple. Tell me about your conception of God. And that threw him. Um, I thought I was being funny because Jim has contemplated this stuff a lot, but it it stuck with him enough that he he wanted to record again with me. And referred to that when we, we sat down. Well, you weren't really fair last time. And, you know, um, and we sort of elliptically explored that and have talked about it subsequently off mic. But for Christian, God and faith suffuse his writing and his life. He's written about it a bunch, uh, especially in his earlier memoir hybrid, My Bright Abyss, where he goes into the the revelation of faith that was well it was part of his god awful cancer news about eighteen years ago and he's had uh life and death struggles um you know to to battle back nah, I hate using those those terms he has uh been on the verge of death several times due to this cancer, and uh, as he'll talk about most recently that happened um this spring when he had a CAR T therapy that we hope is going to wallop the crap out of that cancer. But, um, but this whole faith thing isn't one of those, you know, no atheists and foxholes or, or a <laughs> Hail Mary sort of thing, uh, as it were, of, you know, praying to, to stay alive because, you know, you, you get the news that you're dying. Um, faith becomes something different in his experience a way of of finding the divine in the living world, but not in the, you know, um, oh, there's beauty in the day-to-day. Um, again, something more profound. And I, I don't do him justice, but fortunately, you're going to get to hear him talk about it soon while I nervously dance around how to talk about faith while I'm... Uh, um, I'm not sure. Um, while I'm searching for something, I, I guess... I mean, I've, I've talked about how this podcast sometimes uh, makes me feel like Diogenes, except, you know, instead of carrying a lantern, I'm, I've, I've got a pair of microphones. If I ever get another tattoo, that's, by the way, going to be what it is. Um, but it's that, that sense of a search for something in others or in the interaction with another that awakens something in each of us. That's my... Uh, 
purpose, if that's a thing. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that these past few weeks um, as I've been kind of diving into Christian's work and through a couple of other circumstances, looking at my life and looking at what I've done and, and what I was meant to do if you believe in in a sense of being meant for something. And that's what Zero at the Bone, as well as a few of Christian's previous books, seems to have really done to me or for me. We'll say to me. Um, not that I'm veering toward his view of, of Jesus or anything, which, again, we'll talk about. But I'm listening for uh, for something. I realize this, this all sounds pretty vague and, and you know, abstract while we're while I'm talking here, but um, I hope you're picking up on what I'm getting at. Anyway, um, Christian's writing is a blast. The poetry in the book, even when he's bringing in some of the more difficult selections from other poets, it all feels like a part of a continuum, like a sort of uh, a mosaic that, that can never end. And it's a deeply affecting book, as I think I'm getting across, one that really tries to get at the heart of why we keep struggling for meaning, but finding ourselves in despair and not finding ourselves, but, you know, finding ourselves in uh, this this thing. I should also add, by the way, this is not a depressing or preachy book. It is fun. It is very grounded in the here and now. There are observations about life that are um, hysterical. There are hilarious scenes of Christian's domestic life with his, his wife and two kids. Um, there are tales of his childhood in Texas that reminded me of the movie he would end up citing later in, in the book, Tree of Life by Terrence Malick. Um, and there are observations about living on planet cancer that resonated with me too. Not too much, thankfully, because I'm still pending how next week's check-in goes, uh, just in watch and wait mode. But but it's it's a living book um, of somebody who's who's in very much in the world and very much trying to enjoy what he has, um, both in art and, and life. And the threads of the book just tie together beautifully. It's, it's, it's crafted without feeling forced. The prose is clearly written by a poet. Um, I mean, you can hear sentences just like you can hear verses. It's, um, it's a joy, which is against despair. But you need to go experience this yourself. So go get Zero at the Bone, 50 Entries Against Despair, and uh, get back to me so we can talk about it. Now, as caveats go, um, Christian shifts his legs a couple of times, which sounds kind of scratchy because of where the mic was. Um, and some kids a uh, house or two over were playing in their backyard, which at first I got uptight about and then remembered that uh, uh, the, the laughter of children is what carries prayers to God. So uh, so I learned to let it go. Now, here's Christian's bio. Christian Wyman is the author, editor, or translator of more than a dozen books of poetry and prose, including memoirs My Bright Abyss, Meditations of a Modern Believer, and He Held Radical Light, The Art of Faith, The Faith of Art as well as Every Riven Thing, winner of the Ambassador Book Award, Once in the West, a National Book Critics Circle Award finalist, and Survival is a Style, all published by FSG. He teaches religion and literature at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music and at Yale Divinity School. His new book is Zero at the Bone, 50 Entries Against Despair. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Christian Wyman. So at the beginning of, of the book, um, you, you write, I have no idea what this book will be. What did it become? And how did it become? Uh, well, I was writing... At some point, I, I realized that everything I was writing was revolving around a central subject, despair in one way or another, finding a way out of it. And... and um, I was really tired of having my books come out separately when, as I say in the introduction, I never really thought of them that way. I think I think of them as sort of seamless 
and the prose and the poetry speaking to each other, and even the work I do editing is part of that too. I was going to say it's other people's poetry too. Yeah. But yeah. And and so this idea just came to me to have a book in 50 chapters that would uh, be organized around the subject of despair and would enable me to um, include everything that I do. And it has some organization, has a major essay, each 10 sections. It has um, a collection of quotations, each 10 sections. Each 10 section is about Emily Dickinson or in some way plays off of one of her poems. Um, and then it has two zero sections at the beginning and the end. So the whole book does have a cohesive, in my own mind, form. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, once I had the idea, it really freed me to sort of write towards that. At what point in the process did that hit you? Well, I've, I probably had half the book at that point. I mean, I, I have, everything I've started, I've written half of it before I knew what it was going to be. Yeah. There's, there's a number of moments throughout the book where it's, it's a, it seems to be about its own making, um, mm -hmm. where you're That's true. addressing mm -hmm. the, I'm not sure where this is going, and, and even at the end, I don't know what the last line of this will be, uh, a yeah. page before the end of it. But, right. Um, that, that sense of becoming itself, I guess. Which, yeah, I thought of it. It, yeah. it, it came together some, something like a huge poem. It was very surprising to me the way the ending managed to... Um, speak back to the ending that it starts with a notion of this leopard and then that leopard comes back in the form of a lion at the end that was a complete surprise to me mm -hmm. and very like a poem yeah you were a fan of Lampedusa's the leopard or not well, I was. I read it in college. Okay. I have <laughs> never returned to it. It's a book I, I, I prattle about all the time only because I, I read it in my 40s for the first time and I'm convinced that had I read it in college, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have gotten. Yeah, I don't have a don't have a strong memory of it. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those books from midlife and beyond. Yeah. And I am thankful to to you know at least that's the excuse I give for not having gotten to it until uh, until maybe, I'll, maybe that'll be the next thing I read. Huh? You know, it, it's always the, uh, the the advantage of the show is that I get to find out what other people are reading yeah. and start you know reincorporating all that stuff. But but tell me about despair. You know how it became this this central topic i mean <laughs> well, I think it's, yeah, there's a lot of ways to approach that question but, but yeah, yeah I, the book is really i mean it, it deals with a lot of different kinds of despair um environmental racial religious physical um all kinds of despair but but existential despair is the primary um animating force there and that's something I've fought my whole life. And I think it's a fight that pretty much everyone has to have. If they don't have it, they're not paying attention. And I quote William Bronk in there, says, I deal with despair because I think it's in the nature of the reality of things. Hmm. And that I people tell me I should look away, but I can't. That's that's the reality. Yeah. And, and I feel that it's uh, the reality too. And part of life is at once facing it and find some finding some ways in which you're going to deal with it. And so the book is very much an attempt to do that. And I, I hope it's one of the ways that you do that is with humor. And, yeah. uh, and so the book is, I hope, funny in parts. And um, that's an important part of my life is humor is a very valuable way of dispelling despair. I, I will say, you have one line in it that the... Uh... The contemporary reaction to this state of affairs is mostly either willful obliviousness, frenetic activity, or despair. And frankly, I wonder why it couldn't be all three, because I, I really embody all that right. yeah. myself. Yeah. But, you know, there is a degree of, of um, I would say, the personal without being, uh, you know, personal essay-like. Not, not you know, a contemporary personal essay-like. Mm -hmm. I'm used to, well, recently had my fourth go-round with Philip Lopate, who... We discuss personal essays and, and sort of how they've maybe degraded in, in recent years, or at least some of the aims he sees in it are not embodied by contemporary uh, modern writers. Yeah, I only like personal essays when they're using uh, personal experience as a lens to deal with something larger. Yeah. So I, mine are always 
addressing some sort of existential or theological or philosophical issue or literary issue. And personal experience is sometimes a way to get at it. Yeah. yeah. It's something that I appreciated in the book, the sense of a self without being an overbearing self. Mm-hmm. Although I was going to ask, um, same thing I asked Philip, including your, your wife and kids in, in various points in the essays. Is there anything they, uh, especially as your kids get older, is there anything like, hey, Dad, it'd be nice if you didn't mention us in, in these things, or are they, you know... Well, they happy? haven't read it. I've given them both a copy, but they haven't read it yet, so we'll <laughs> see. I, I mean, they know that these the stories that are in there have been told are so much a part of our family lore that that's not going to be a surprise to them. Yeah, know, that, more the sharing them with the public. So what, what's that? Yeah. More the sharing them with the public right, side right. of things. <laughs> so tell me about... I don't know, it's an insanely vague question, but um, poetry and I, I hate to say, you know, what it means or, you know, what it means to you or how it provides this this response to despair. Um, Again, horrendously vague. Feel free to reframe that and, and answer <laughs> answer the question you'd like to answer about poetry. Well, I think any work of art is uh, in some ways an action against despair. Even if you, there's a famous poem got by Philip Larkin called Obad um, that starts, I work all day and get half drunk at night, waking at four to soundless dark, I stare. In time, the curtains will grow light. Till then, I see what's really always there, unresting death, a whole day nearer now making all thought impossible, but how and where and when I shall myself die. Arid interrogation, yet the dread of dying and being dead flashes afresh to hold and horrify. And it goes on for several stanzas and gets no lighter. Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's one of my favorites. Yeah. (laughs) And and I teach that poem and and ask people, is is this a poem of, of pure despair? And even is it a religious poem? How do you talk about it in those in those terms? And and um, part of my point, Milos was infuriated by that poem because he thought that Larkin had betrayed the poetic profession yes, by giving in to despair, hmm. by articulating a kind of nihilism. And uh, I have two different reactions to that. First of all, I think articulating nihilism is valuable because then at least you know where you stand. Mm-hmm. And and then also I think um, an articulation of despair is itself a refutation of despair, because if you're in pure despair, you're mute, and simply the act of creating this thing uh, is an act of it's it's you can call it an act of joy. Actually, my guess is that he finished that poem. He felt joyful, mm-hmm. uh, even though it's a poem that is about pure despair. So I guess one thing that poetry can do is that. Yeah. Um, the sun okay. still has to rise. It's an obad. It's it's still welcoming the day. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. It's a it's a chilling poem in a lot of a lot of respects, and and a lot of this stuff I've only discovered uh, after, as we mentioned before, we started recording my diagnosis. Blah blah blah. The listeners all know about this. Um, but yeah, seeing his response to to the end, knowing the the sort of terror of death that Larkin had. Well, I wonder, there, there's a part in the book about creative writing versus destructive writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, or, well, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, and how this fits, I suppose, in, in you know, either of those categories. Yeah. You mentioned the, the, the need to capture or express nihilism is better than hiding from a... Yeah. I mean, the irony of with Larkin is that in that poem is that he hates life so much, and yet he's so fearful of death. You find this in a lot of people's lives, that it's uh, the people who are most miserable who are most afraid of death. And whereas often people who are joyful are not afraid of death. Louise Glick has a, a beautiful poem called Celestial Music, in which she's having an argument with a friend, and the friend is religious, and... Louise, who's clearly Louise in the poem, is saying she's always at war with vitality, or always so eager to oppose vitality, is what she says. Whereas her friend is um, 
perfectly comfortable to see this dying caterpillar that they come upon and comfortable to let things die in their natural order and including herself and um, um, her joy at life includes the possibility of death and not not because she projects herself beyond it and thinks she's going to survive her death it's simply a it's simply a natural part of, of life. And I was terrified of death for years, and then once I actually got close to it the first time, uh, it all went away. I wasn't, I wasn't scared of it anymore. Yeah. Um, again, I've, I've talked about it on Mike, but my 10-day interim between you need to see this doctor and then walking in and getting, oh, Gail, you're perfectly fine, everything's going to be okay for another 30 or 40 years. Those 10 days I spent listening to the void mm -hmm. it's still here you know especially with these six month check-ins it's a if something does change you know but at the time and in the moment having those 10 days to contemplate it I I was 50 I felt reconciled you know I, I felt if this is you know if I'm going to get the bad news bad news you know, what have I done with my life and do I think it was enough? Um, and then I got whipsawed into, oh, no, no, you need to go live another 30 or 40 years and go do your thing, which is, again, disconcerting. You, right. on the other hand, got the worst news and it got worse and worse over, over time. Can you, I say relive that, but, you know, can you talk a little about the, uh, that sense of, of acceptance that you developed? or what it was well I just it was before I had kids and then once yeah. I once I had kids I became terrified of death again mm. um, I'm not very I'm not very scared of my own dying but, but I do really worry about my kids yeah. um, but I was really sick this last spring and I had an experimental marrow transplant in Boston where I spent five weeks and I was pretty sure I was going to die then yeah. and but it worked and so I, did, I didn't think I'd see this book published. I did, really didn't think there was a chance. And um, so I'm delighted to see it published. And I'm having that experience of, well, here, it looks like this is going to last a while. So what do you do now? <laughs> <laughs> this is always the, boy, I hate taking up an hour of somebody's life when they really get thought about the end of their lives. <laughs> oh, like early on, I, I recorded with a guy who... Uh, recurrent prostate cancer, thought he had two years left to live. I flew out to Ohio to record with him, and um, he ended up dying six months after instead of two years after. And I had that sense of responsibility, I, I suppose, that you know he, he, he gave me some of that time um, that he had left. Well, we were talking about Donald Hall before this started, yeah. and he was a friend of mine, and he was given a diagnosis of liver metastatized liver cancer when he was in his early 50s. And then it, and it just didn't kill him. I mean, they said that this is going to kill you, and then it just didn't. Yeah. And he wrote a famous essay in the Times saying goodbye, saying he'd stopped reading because, you know, what's reading for if you don't share it with people? And, yeah. You know. That's all sorts of questions I've been wondering, even before my own situation with others. <laughs> Were there things you hadn't read when you first got your diagnosis that you thought either... I need to read this before I'm gone, or what's the point of reading this? Like, you know, with that initial phase for you, you know. It was more a generalized feeling. I do love to read, and I would, I, uh, yeah, I remember writing about it in my journal. That I, it made me sad to think of the books I wouldn't read. Yeah. yeah. In the case of that guy with prostate cancer, English professor, he'd never read Anna Karenina. And I said to him, do you? plan on it <laughs> I really don't know if, if if that would be the yes I should or I'll go back to the things I love what did he say no, I've got to go back and, and you know listen to that one I just mm -hmm. remember the moment of, of realizing boy an English professor who's never read Anna Karenina was more shocking to me than the, the mortal mm -hmm. uh, terminal situation but yeah, you know, with 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 Donald Hall I, I felt the well I've taken up certain traditions um, or built certain traditions in my own uh, um, non-terminal way. Um, they center around the high holidays. So the, the night of Yom Kippur, I'll reread One Road, his essay about uh, traveling in, in Eastern Europe with his first wife and 
kind of let the, the day go from there. From then, I, I, until this year, I've been reading books written by people who were dying, um, like Hitchens's Mortality book or Harold Brodke or uh, Anatole Broyard's Intoxicated by My Illness. Um, I think with this past year, I've gotten over that. Uh, I, I read a couple of more contemporary ones, uh, Jillian Rose and somebody else. And I teach that book, Love's Work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there was also the woman who was semi-adopted by Doris Lessing. I'm blanking on her name now. <coughs> Jenny Diskey, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, <coughs> and realized I need to stop looking in that direction for, for any sort of wisdom now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, to try to get, you know, broader. But um, I'm sorry to do all the gapping in our, our conversation. But um, no. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curious about what that, that how your asymptote towards mortality changed you, changed your art, changed what you wrote and, and how. And I know you're a different person. You were diagnosed in your late 30s, right? Right. I was 39. But I, I um, yeah, that, the book I published, I published two books in quick succession there, Every Ribbon Thing and then My Bright Abyss. And both those have a real urgency to them that uh, my work hadn't had before then. Yeah. Uh, although the same obsessions, my obsessions didn't change. How do you characterize those, besides despair, as you'd mentioned? And, and... Oh, I'm obsessed with God. Yeah. Um, I'm obsessed with the meaning of existence. Yeah. And I'm obsessed with death, um, with love, too. And, and in later life, I've become obsessed with joy. I did a whole anthology of poems about joy and about what experiences of joy mean for our life as a whole, how we can integrate them or not, what happens if we don't integrate them. And, mm -hmm. um, so that's been an obsession of mine, too. That's what my name means in Hebrew, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I always thought it was ironic. But but anyway, that's <laughs> um, <laughs> only because I kept my mom 15 extra days before, beyond her due date. And, uh, I don't think joy was on her mind at all after 24 right. hours of labor, but yeah, that's, that's where they went. Um, but yeah, it's something I found in the book, especially there is that celebratory nature, not simply a negation of despair, but a, a sense of, of you know, again, the positive mm -hmm. of joy. You've mentioned the thesis that uh, traumatic events are carried genetically, um, you know, or written onto to the DNA, basically, and, and carried through generation to generation and speculate about, you know, the good stuff too, right. or the joyous events also etched into us right. somehow. They never, they never talk about that. Whether yeah. our joys were passed down as well, somehow epigenetically. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, again, it's it's. I was happy to read this and and you know get again not simply a buck up everybody we're against despair but you know <laughs> a, a more thoughtful take and even the commonplace book sections where it's the these wonderful selections you were picking of of uh, poems and excerpts really. Uh, moved me to the point at which is something I, I figure I'm going to be returning to uh, uh, mm. a couple of times for this book. So, given that most of the reading I do is for the show, you know, it's actually a compliment to say I might have to go back and read right. this again yeah. after. <laughs> Partly because you do characterize yourself in a term that I, I wish to God I had thought of. For me, having a ninja blender for a brain, yeah. um, that that sense of just bringing in uh, so much or just trying to. to synthesize something out of all this. Yeah, I'm amazed at my colleagues because they have such a, a singular capacity for focus. Yeah. They can just go, you know, they're scholars and they can just, I mean, mine the depths of some one subject. And I can't do that. I really do have, my brain is magpie-like. It just picks up all kinds of things all over the place. And, hmm. But I'm, I'm reconciled to it. Yeah. At this point, changing. Right. Would be kind of, yeah. <laughs> it's like when I recorded with Peter Sheldahl near the end, and you know, I could quit smoking, but really, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, eh, not so much. Um, what do you learn from teaching? Um, well, my most of my students are graduate students, and mm -hmm. and um, a number of them have already had careers and are coming back to school, so they have a lot to teach. Um, I learn things all the time from them, serious things that it, even in my own discipline that I haven't come across. Uh, more than that, I guess, what I've learned is that I, I was answering a question in an interview a couple weeks ago and someone asked me how I thought about 
callings in one's life. And, and um, I realized that I have come to think of it differently because I always would just say, oh, my calling is to be a writer and everything else is a distraction. And for years I lived that way and I, I just found, I found teaching a burden and editing too a burden. Um, but at some point with both of those, and it was the illness that, that made me have to change it, I, uh, I realized they both had become callings in a different way. I think there are callings we're given and then callings we earn. And the writing for me is one that I was given. I could never look away from it and I would just wither and die if I hadn't done it. But teaching and editing, I could very easily live my life without doing. Um, but I earned the calling. I, by going deeply into them, they became something that has become integral to my life. And, uh, and so teaching has taught me a great deal in that regard. Um, largely that if I can give myself over to them and not to think of this is something I'm going to get the time in class. Not, I may not learn anything from them, um, but that's not the point. The whole point is what do they get? And if I can think of it in that regard, then um, it becomes very joyful. And uh, if you're just thinking of, all right, my job is to deliver this material in such a way that it can enter their lives and they can do with it what they will. Hopefully it'll change them in some way but that's for them to deal with, but, but, but that's my job. And it's not to be um, reawakened poetically or to see something in literature that I hadn't seen before or nothing like that. And sometimes that happens, that's just a bonus. But my job is, is to um, create that space for them and I, I quite love it now when it goes well. You've been at it long enough. Have you have you seen a legacy? Have you reached a point of uh, those people are, I was teaching have actually? Yeah, there are, there are people out there. Yeah, they're um, in the world doing things. I mean, mine is not like a you know I'm not an MFA program, so my students. Oh, are, I don't mean whether they became a writer. Whether yeah. they became something that matters yeah they're out there doing things that's what I so admire about the Div School because they're out there these people are going into professions where they're not going to make a lot of money to put it mildly and they really are trying to do good in the world and so yeah I have people who, in, who are ministers all over the country they're working in prisons they're working in hospices they're working in the military they're doing all these different things and sometimes the, they're using poetry in what they're doing, which is very gratifying. I get these letters sometimes from people who have used poetry in one way or another. I've, I've taught a course a number of times. She's gone now, the woman I taught with, Maggie Dawn, but it was a course called Poetry for Ministry. And we would have them use poems in all these different situations they might encounter in uh, pastoral ministry. And... And yeah, we would hear from them years later that the ways that they were still using those poems uh, in hospitals or wherever. And yeah, that's very gratifying to think of poetry entering life in that way. Because one of my obsessions has been the relation or uh, um, antipathy or something between art and life. Tension. Tension is a good yeah. word, yeah. I mean, to, and, you know, Henry James actually thought it was an antipathy, not just a te uh, not just a tension, yeah, but, well. <laughs> but uh, and Rilke thought that way too, and and uh, Yeats did too, and and uh, I was very influenced by that when I was young, and I mean, part of my education has been to see those two things as um, coextensive. How much of faith play into that? Or change that that a hundred percent perspective. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. It has everything to do with the totality uh, of you, or just the totality of me, my life in the world, what I think existence is. Um, uh, yeah, it has everything to do with that.
Uh, and Prophet Muhammad's settled belief is that there is a unity, that we don't, we're not inhabiting a chaos, there is a unity of experience. And a lot of time it doesn't look like that, but we're given glimpses when it does. And part of that unity is the communication that we have with each other, which is often nonverbal, but poetry has a lot to do with that. And uh, so when I say that I'm gratified by seeing these things in the world, what I really mean is that I'm, I'm seeing what to me is the work of God in the world. And in my small way, I'm participating in it. In this book, and I think in My Bright Abyss, you bring scenes of, of, I don't know if it's New York life, but literary life, where where faith is something that's either non-existent or unspoken, I suppose. Is there a degree to which, again, you feel that your faith, I don't even know how to put it, outside of alienates you from artsy literary people in the world, um, the, the, the more secular almost nihilistic uh, arts world. You do bring up a novel by an unnamed writer in, in this book that you ultimately, I don't want to say found unworthy, but empty, I, I suppose. Yeah, it was a, a toy despair is what I called it. It, yeah. it, was, a, it was a despair <clears throat> completely obsessed with himself. Um, uh, I don't feel alienated Unless, there, unless someone has a real antipathy towards religion, mm-hmm. and I do come across that, <laughs> yeah. but, but I have a real antipathy to religion. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, That's why I'm trying to use faith the right. way you use it in, in, in your terminology. But, um, but I think that, um, I mean, the reason I teach where I do and what I do is because I think that a lot of the role of religion has been taken up by literature and that a lot of people, a lot of my students, find their way to a kind of faith, however you want to define it, through literature now and not through um, sacred texts or religious experience. And I think poets are sustaining faith even when they don't believe in it, even when they don't believe in it. God or anything beyond it that as I said the act of poem I think the act of writing a poem is a gesture of faith in some way and uh, I think there's a real disconnection a cognitive dissonance between often between the work that contemporary poets do and the way they talk about faith in their lives because I'll often read a poem that seems to me an expression of faith and must have been pure joy to the writer to write. It must have seemed like it came from somewhere outside of them, as we all say poems do. But then in an interview or in their life, when you talk to them, they'll discount any notion of there being anything other than a material world. And I think that disjunct is a bit of an existential flinch. And a refusal to see the reality of what happens in the work. Um, so I don't feel uh, alienated, actually, from the literary world. I feel a great kinship, usually, with um, with um, the writers I admire. Yeah. Yeah, that was my Bloom, uh, Harold Bloom interview back in 2016 had his... In another time, I would have been a rabbi. He's yeah. an element. He, he said, you know, it's, I happen to be a professor at Yale instead. But, um, you yeah, know, for him, I think the, the, well, the Gnostic faith and everything else that, that um, as a Jew, I, I tend to fall more towards the, and this is something in that haiku for business traveler zine, the, the Ezra Pound piece that I mentioned, um, that sense of uh, shattered vessels, that, that, mystic uh, conception of the universe that for that that um, Jewish faith the tikkun olam is is the deal trying to restore the universe from its its shattered origins from the light of the creator I mm-hmm. guess um, that's a very useful metaphor I think 
Yeah, and you get at it. The problem is I've read two of your other books in the last two weeks also, so I'm going to blend uh, uh, Mm -hmm. three together. It it might be from my bright abyss. But you bring up that sense of a crack in the universe as Mm -hmm. well as a, a unity. Um, yeah, that's in that book. Is it in this? Okay, good, good. That's yeah. Um, which I, I, a thing that I appreciate about um, the thing I like about you is that you're not exclusive about Christianity being, you know, the way. Um, mm-hmm. We'll just put it that way. That sense of, of faith is the um, what's important, and then in your case, as you make the case, um, the example of of a living and dying Christ is. Well, what is it, I guess? <laughs> I was going to say the root, but I realize you're probably going to be better at enumerating this than I am. So. Uh, yeah, it's everything to me. I was yeah. on, I, I can't remember if, I, if that's in this book, but I was on a podcast for yeah. a tablet. And yeah, you mentioned the Jewish mentioned, podcast, yeah. and I have a theory about that too. But and Yeah, he asked me, it was Mark Oppenheimer asked me, you know, he said, you know, I understand why you believe in God, but I just can't understand why you're a Christian and so I've tried to address that some in this book Um, but yeah uh, your Jewish God seems to be derived from Job yeah probably at least in in this book you know if there's a a Jewish resonance it's with that which is you know potentially not really you know concurrent with with the uh, with the rest of the Torah Oh, I know. Yeah, and I, my, yeah, you know, my friend Ilya Kaminsky tells me I'm Jewish. He said, keeps saying, "You're a Jew. You're a Jew." <laughs> I mean, if it's a sense of wonder about the shape of the universe, you could also, you know, say you're you're Socratic, or at least right. you know, following uh, uh, Greek philosophers. Um, but yeah, the the you know, I, I get where the the tablet guy where Oppenheimer was coming from in those terms. If it's you know that that sense of wonder, but I, again, the what we don't have is the physical embodiment. Right, the incarnation for yeah. me is is very important. Um, uh, the notion of the physical world being sacred because God was incarnate, but also even more than that, it's the notion of God being with us in suffering, and not above us, and not not uh, anywhere else, but actually with us suffering. To Job, he's a whirlwind. To Moses, he can't actually look on his face. Right. You know, what he can see is God praying himself when he's in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that, that's where we leave off. <laughs> you know, yeah. as, as Jews, you know, mm-hmm. we, we got that far. But, but yeah, it's, it's you know, something I, I found, um, again, not knowing what shape or form your faith took before, you know, diving into your work like this. Uh, I came out of it with a, you know, a, a great deal of respect and also a sense of... of As you put it, that that I'd say less of a tension, more of uh, almost a synthesis between art and 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 life. Mm-hmm. The notion you bring up, and I forget who the the thinker was who contended that gods exist because we make art. We need something higher to to appreciate what we've created. Uh, but I, I'm blanking on who it is now. Um, so am I. Um... But it's in your book. I, I, <laughs> It's Juan Ramon Jimenez. That's who it is. Okay. Juan Ramon Jimenez. Yeah. 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 You at least bring it up as a, a, you know, somebody's idea as opposed to, you know, something you fully endorse, I think. But, right. Yeah. But that sense of, you know, what it means to make art, what it means to keep writing when you know your body's trying to kill you. Um, yeah. Well, yes. I mean, I wonder why, you know, why do... I talk about this with my students. Why do you continue to write if you know that no one's going to read it? If you, um, uh, I, mean, I have a good friend, one of the best poets in the country, but no one knows who he is really, and few people. And and uh, he's had a different publisher with every book. He's in his seventies now, and I got a letter from him saying I I remain loyal to the irrationality of it which I thought was just such a beautiful expression, because what else do we remain? I mean, how else do we hold on to that which we love, including a faith or the, a love of our lives? Or It's irrational. I mean, the main things in our lives. And, but the notion also is, you know, what are you writing for? And someone writing on their own, knowing that no one's going to read what they're writing, and yet they continue to do it. 
um, I think your audience there is God. You try to make it as good as you can, and this is why poets persist. I'm not sure many fiction writers would if they knew they didn't have an audience at all. But poets persist um, in the face of absolute despair uh, because there is some possible communication between those words and God. And the greatness of the art is not at issue there. It's, it's available to all kinds of people. It's something you bring up in, uh, in He Held Radical Light, that everyone, the great poets you knew, knew no one was, that, that their work would not last, last, I guess. And how disheartening that was, and yet you keep going. Right. Donald Hall told me that when, I, when he was 37, I think, or yeah. 36, I can't remember, but, he, but I was the exact same age when he told me. And he just said, I knew, he said, I knew when I was 36 that not a word I wrote was going to last. And I remember just being so shocked by that. And because he was just, he, you know, he'd probably written 30 books since that time. And um, now I understand. Hmm. Where'd poetry begin for you? Well, that. Not the magazine. Right, right. I used, to, I used to write, I used to, I mean, I grew up in a house with no books in it and certainly no poetry and no conception. There was any such, such thing as a living poet, but I grew up surrounded by hymns and, and I would write these little rhyming things when I was a kid and, and actually wrote one when I was uh, seven or eight years old. And when we went to the First Baptist Church in Dallas and I... Uh, went down and put it in the offering plate, or when they not the offering plate, uh, I went down and gave it to the minister, the minister, Brother Criswell. Turns out to be a repellent man, but I, uh, at the time when they were making an altar call, when people go down there and give their souls, I actually gave this poem, and I love the Lord and He loves me. I will not forget, and neither will He. That's the whole poem, and, and they published it in the Southern Baptist Newsletter, and so it was like my first publication. Um, so clearly I was interested in sounds and bits of music when I was a kid, but I didn't come across poetry until I was in college. And I was an economics major and um, took an English class and then became interested. I just knew, I knew absolutely nothing. And, and, and then I got Yeats and Eliot on my own and, and um, didn't understand it, but I just love the sounds and and that made me just want to make those sounds and once I started doing that I was just lost I was just I just began spending all my time doing that until the, by the time I left college I was just I had I declared to everyone this is it this is what I'm going to be firmly unemployable I'm yeah, just kidding. exactly <laughs> yeah well it was 10 years of abject poverty and you know just I mean, bare bones living. Yeah. I didn't do that. I, I I wrote about it last week in my uh, in, with uh, the Substack that I do. Uh, when I finished grad school, there was, you know, Gil's going to be a writer, but uh, couldn't find a gig. Just couldn't find a job in New York that paid more than eighteen thousand dollars back in nineteen ninety five, which in New York equals abject poverty basically yeah, it's crushing yeah and just decided not to and, and went into trade magazines and now lobbyist etc where I spend my Saturdays sitting in traffic on the, the Marriott yeah. to, to come up here and talk to real real artists and real writers um, who's the the first real poet you met uh, there was a guy named Dabney Stewart who was a um, he had Quite a career when he was young. He was published with Knopf, and he was at Washington Lee University, which is where I ended up going to school. And uh, simply because they were the only school that sent me anything in the mail, and I went without even visiting. And um, they gave me money, and and uh, uh, and I paid for the rest. Um, yeah, he was the first, and I never took a class with him, but. I showed him my poems when I was in college, and then we we had a correspondence after college for about ten years. And uh, 
he was yeah really really important to me. Yeah. In the book, you've got a one of the longer pieces goes into your family, your your father and your your sister, and your your time in and around a mental institution, but not actually in. Um, right. Um, yeah. Um, but you go into well. Your father died in 2015. How did that affect you? And how did it affect your art, I guess? Um, as somebody whose father's still alive and from whom I still feel um, tension is the word we used before mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what you can say and can't say. Um, how did you find that affecting you? And did you feel a sense of permission I in his know. absence to, to publish what you did? Oh, I was never worried about that before. He would never read, never come across what I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, did that bother you? No. Not that this is a therapy session. Really. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, my father's death didn't affect me much because I had been estranged from him for so long. Uh, and, and at least in, in any way that I'm aware, it didn't have some profound effect on me. Um, he was so gone in the later part of his life. He was just so addicted to drugs and... Uh, and that's how he died, an overdose eventually. And so I never had my kids meet him. And, and um, I mean, it's a real tragic story. He was a very intelligent man and uh, capable of so much, but he it, it, it just, he suffered from despair. You talk about that, he just could not ever get out of his despair and used alcohol for a number of years and then drugs and just couldn't get out of it. And you contrast him with your your sister. Yeah, who, she did. She turned. Yeah. She got off of drugs the minute that he died, miraculously, because she was on meth and serious serious stuff. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, and she had been in and out of prison and um, had a really brutal life. Um, and it's not it's no picnic now, but she's not on drugs. Um, but yeah, she had a real turnaround when he died. Yeah, it was, it was something like a miracle, actually. The third major character in this chapter of the, the book is you as a novelist, or the novel you, you tried to write. Is that something you, you thought of revisiting in the slightest? Or are you really just I, prose? I think I've put it away. I, yeah. I, um, the, the weird thing is, is the characters are still so alive in me. I still yeah. just think about them, and um, they were really alive. Uh, but I just couldn't seem to finish the book. And now it's like, I did look at it uh, after I published that essay, actually. I, I looked at it and um, it has some really good parts. It's just, it feels like another person wrote it. And it's, and it's not really an, uh, it's not really the kind of book I'd want to read. I always find myself writing books that I want to read. That's really what the Zero at the Bone is. And, um, when I read that novel, I just think, you know, this is not... I wouldn't buy this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that about the show. You know, you make the podcast you would actually want to listen to, yeah. um, which is why I do all the talking. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> what were the... Was there a sort of model as far as, as Zero at the Bone goes, or your, your essays in general? Did you have writers that you sort of... I mean, you can... there, or are you sort of working your way through... Uh, well, I mean, Fernando Pessoa, has, he's got the Book of Disquiet, but he doesn't include poems in that, but that is a book that I do admire. Uh, Fanny Howe is another writer whose work has meant a great deal to me, and uh, she's never published a book like this, but she does have these books of nonfiction that contain all different kinds of um, writing in them. Uh, I admire what Ann Carson does, even when I can't follow it. I uh, often don't understand quite what she's up to, but uh, her mind is very interesting, I think, in the way, and and her um, fearlessness and the kinds of directions she pushes herself in terms of genre and colliding these different things together. Maybe those, um, but there, I really can't think of a book that's like zero at the bone. Yeah, yeah. that's what I wondered because yeah. I, I do a lot of essay reading and don't have any, you know, precursor or comp for this. Yeah. Um, 
for which I'm thankful. Originality mm-hmm. is is you know, in this day and age, especially, you know, finding a new form or a new way to to combine like this is tremendous. So one of the questions I asked Harold Bloom, and I figure I should ask you the same thing, especially because you were facing death numerous times, including last year. Um, poems you would want read at your memorial? Hmm, never thought of it. Really? Okay, because I just figured that would have been the, I'm lying here in bed, I may as well start planning. Uh, okay. No, never thought of it at all. I never nothing. I really like... Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. The poems I think I wouldn't really be appropriate. I mean, my, one of my favorite poets is Yehuda Amachai. There's probably something from him that would be perfect. I really love Amachai. Just for reference's sake, Bloom went with uh, To Brooklyn Bridge by Hart Crane, Wet Casement by Ashbury, and Ordinary Evening in New Haven from uh, from Stevens. That was at least a couple of lines from each one. But, of course, he didn't want a memorial service of any kind. But <laughs> if they insist, he said, and, and started reciting. Well, I might like, I mean, see, mine wouldn't be like that. I like, there's a poem called Prayer by Carol Ann Duffy. Oh, I know one. Yeah. Anna, Anna Kamienska's A Prayer That Will Be Answered. Yeah. That's in there. It's in the yeah. book, yeah. 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 yeah, that's a good one. That goes to the heart of... Uh, where my spirit lies. Yeah, you speak of it glowingly. Yeah, that's... Lovingly, I think. Yeah. Um, and then there's one by Carol Ann Duffy, just called Prayer. That's in the book, too. Um, that would be one that I would like quite a bit. Some days, although we cannot pray, a prayer utters itself. It's a beautiful poem. And did poetry give you solace at any point? Definitely, yeah. And I, I mean, you talk about how it's not... Well, talk about that, I guess. Well, there have been times when it's gone away for me, and and including times of real suffering, but in this last time in March is when I had that, but I was really deathly sick for the six months prior. I really couldn't get out of bed very much. Um, but yeah, I would I would read all kinds of poetry, but... In that instance, it's uh, it's usually not the content that I feel rescued by. It's some sort of formal perfection. And uh, Wordsworth is somebody I return to all the time. And it's he really got something with the. Uh, I mean, he he's wise. He, he he has brilliant formulations of what it is to be in the world and to exist as a complete person. But but he also he he managed to find a form that just burrows down in consciousness sonically. And you can almost read it without knowing the words. You, I mean, I can imagine someone who doesn't know English getting consolation out of the Wordsworth lines mm-hmm. simply because of the um, deep calm um, and unity that he manages to convey with sound. So he's always someone that I return to. Can you quiet the void? Does it does it call? Well, poetry helps. Yeah. Um, my wife helps. Um, and having kids, I mean, I, I don't. So that's a that's a radical break between us because that's. That's living beyond yourself. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I don't know if you can. That fundamental, the, the void that William Bronk is talking about in that sentence I quoted earlier, that's, that's uh, something that's with you all the time, I think. How's your family handle your, your health up and down? Uh, well, they were this. If it's too personal, don't don't go into it. I'm just no, telling. No, I mean it's been it's very tough for my wife. She's been through hell, um, twenty years of hell, nineteen years. Um, I've I've had the experience. Any other time in in history, I'd be dead. I've had the experience of being saved by three drugs that came on the market right when I needed them, mm-hmm. and two of them were pills. Um, this last one was not a drug exactly. They re-engineered my T-cells, but 
Um, you know, CAR T therapy. Yeah, yeah. But they, um, <clears throat> yeah. they, um, I mean, these things weren't available, and um, and so I've been rescued three times. Um, it's been especially difficult for my wife. Much of my worst illness occurred before my kids were conscious of it. Like I was hospitalized for long periods when they were very young and they would come to the hospital and stuff. They don't remember that. So this was really the first time that I've been deathly sick and they had to confront that. It was quite difficult, quite difficult for them, I think. Um, they handled it well and they've come through on the other side very well. And, and um, of course, now it looks like you know, the cancer has gone. So they're back to normal. CAR T is apparently incredible. That that's been the if my CLL ever progresses ten, twenty years from now, chances are by then you know, we'll have an awful there are already a lot of good treatments in place, but um, they will probably be able to wallop it completely. But yeah. you know. But I'm yeah. still hoping. I'll I'll never find out. So yeah. uh, any sign your your wife is a poet too, or at least has published as a poet. Any sign your kids are going into the family business or are they No, they don't okay. like poetry. They they used to memorize poems and uh, I'm actually gonna start offering them money to memorize. They want to earn some money, and I'm going to offer that as a <laughs> way of earning some money. But, um, yeah, my wife's also a memoirist. She wrote a brilliant book that just came out a couple of months ago called Holler, A Poet Among Patriots. She has a very interesting childhood growing up with her father died, but she was raised by her grandfather, who was the um, commandant of the Marine Corps during Vietnam. And so she grew up in a kind of military atmosphere and has a lot of fascinating stories to tell about that. I can come back up. You know, yeah, I, I can do sure. another weekend with her. You know, we'll sit down and talk. But I also did want to uh, give you credit when we were talking about the book of Job earlier. Um, you nailed Tree of Life by Terrence Malick perfectly in, in, in the book with what makes that movie as special as it is. Um, mm. Because it's something I will... Sit down. My wife can't stand it, but I will just sit down and watch that movie for you know two plus hours and just kind of take a, in the wonder. It's uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's a, that's a real masterpiece. That movie. I also loved uh, Hidden Life. His last, I think it was his most recent. Yeah, I haven't movie. seen it yet. Yeah, he actually asked us to screen it. We we screened it and gave him comments before it was out, which was an exciting thing to do. Hmm. Yeah. It, had you had a relationship with him? No. Oh, okay. No. Did you ever think you were going to end up at Yale Divinity School, by the way? You mentioned not having any background oh whatsoever to prepare you for or to qualify you necessarily for, for this. No, never in a million years. Um, I wish I had known about such a place when I was in my 20s because I was floundering around, although I guess I would have gone crazy having to write papers and such. But, um, but no, it came about quite serendipitously I was ready to leave poetry and they invited me to give a lecture here and um, I just really liked the students uh, preparing to leave poetry magazine right. mean, it's not poetry as a field but right. yeah go on and and um, so I wrote when I got back to Chicago I just wrote him a letter and said you know I was half joking but I was serious about leaving I said why don't you create a position for a poet and that happened Oh, they had they didn't have a role. Pre you weren't oh, filling no. an existing. No, they just notion. no. They created it and and at, at Yale and Yale and Harvard still have they're still prickly about the PhD and you know I don't have any degrees aside from an undergraduate degree and that was hard for me to get and um so that was a, like a sticking point but but it worked out yeah they created a position it took, took a while. while. What's that? You found a home. Yeah, I found a home. They've been very welcoming to me, and and uh, I like it. It's, it's I mean, it's just such an unusual place for me to be. But uh, as I say, the students are great. There is that sense. I, one I recorded with Langdon Hammer years and years ago about the, the James Merrill biography, I realized it was likely the closest I was ever going to get to the Ivies in, <laughs> in my life. So, you know, actually sitting in his office and, and recording, I'm like, oh. Yeah, technically, I've I've been to an Ivy League school now. Yeah. I mean, I've walked around Princeton, also being you know an hour plus away. But yeah, it was a uh, you know the realization that it's a 
a world that we know exists, but we don't know, you know, right. what it really means, means, I guess. Yeah. It's an exclusive place. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is, I mean, you know, does, I do have misgivings about that, but the Divinity School is pretty particular. Yeah. It's not, it's not really, uh, it's set apart from Yale, set apart physically mm-hmm. and, and also set apart intellectually. Yeah. It's a different place. Had you ever thought of ministry? Uh, I've preached a number of times. Yeah, I did think of it when I was at Poetry Magazine. I, when I was trying to think of what direction I might go in, I thought I might do that. I just I, I hate school so much that I wouldn't be able to stand school. Um, but also, I I doubt I'd be very good at pastoral care. I mean, I'm, I'm good at preaching, but I don't think I'd the day to day. I don't think I'd be great at helping people out in their crises. Yeah. Uh, did you ever come up with a, an adequate answer to your, your daughter's question as to why you're a poet? Is that a... <laughs> it comes up in the book. Well, no, really, Daddy, why are you a poet? No, I tried to give her the real answers. You know, I love language. And I'm trying to express the world and all these things. and But no, she, she wouldn't... That it, it, it was a long time ago, but my memory is... She was, ba- she was baffled. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, double question of, of what comes next and how do you, given the precariousness of your health on and off, think about next and what that means? I don't know what comes next in terms of writing. I haven't... Yeah, uh, I wasn't sure if you'd started or... I write, I've written a lot of uh, these notes, but I don't know what they are. I don't know what what will happen to them. There are scraps of poems in there. and uh, Maybe it's a book of some sort. I don't know. I, but maybe it's, I'm just supposed to be quiet for a while. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Despite all the gapping I've done, I've found myself quieter since exploring your work. Um, I've, I've sort of disappeared online. I've kind of outside of uh, taking a picture during the drive up of somebody's dog leaning out the window really, really far while we were both traveling at 60 mm-hmm. miles an hour on the merit. And I had to post that right away while we were sitting in traffic after. Um, but I found myself trying to, trying to hear something in the stillness, I guess. Um, so you've had that effect. You know, you've made my wife think something's wrong. But um, <laughs> other than that, so, uh, honey, I'm, I'm reading. I'm thinking a lot now. And, and that's, um, yeah, that sense of, of being still, I suppose. Um, most people write too much. I've probably written too much. You know, it becomes a, a uh, compulsion writing. I, talk, I write about that in one of these essays, that, the one about the snakes. It, 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 um, mm-hmm. Writing becomes a kind of addiction or compulsion and you have to manage that you have to not inflict all that on somebody <laughs> <You see? laughs> that's a great term to use I, I um, you know I, I, it's a question I had as to how a book like this comes together you mentioned you know the organizing principle but is there that sense of things were accreting before you understood oh, yeah. what you had Definitely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that was a real release once I realized that I was writing in a certain direction and um, and had a sense about how these things might hold together. Yeah. I always write. I don't understand. I'm very envious of people who go out and get book contracts to write about yeah. professional tennis or some, some subject. Salt. Or some, yeah, right. whatever. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for me, it's just a, this chaos and... I mean, I guess I could do that, commit to a book, write a, just a nonfiction book, but somehow it seems boring to me. And, and so I just write until I figure out where I'm going. Um, I expect I'll do that again if, if, any, if I'm going to do something else. Does the poetry come easier than it once did? Not at all. Or tougher? It's the same. Yeah. It's just... Uh, no, it's not any easier. No, it's still rare. Right now, I haven't written. A, I don't think I've written a word of poetry in six months or so. It's just not there. Is there any sort of halo that that occurs to you, almost like a, a 
let's say epilepsy seizure or something, just that moment of something is, is happening in my mind? Yeah. Or is it really just when you're at the, the table? No, something starts to happen. Yeah. Yeah, something starts to happen in the world and words start to hang together, experiences start to hang together. It's, it's a, yes, and there's usually, so it's usually not just one poem that'll come, it's a cluster of them. My standard question for any artist, especially one working in a finite form, when do you know it's done? When is something right? Well, Valerie has that famous line that a poem is never finished, it's only abandoned. Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, um, I know what he means there, but uh, Yeats has the line about uh, that a, a box clicking shut. He knew, knew when his poems were um, done because he could hear this box clicking shut. I remember someone telling me, this woman telling me all she could hear when, when she thought of that was a very expensive car door clicking. Like, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it's different with, with uh, various poems. There are some poems that I know are utterly finished and I'm sure of it um, because of the form of them. The form falls into place so utterly. Um, but then there are some that have never quite come right for me, but they're just as good as I can do. And those really are abandoned. Hmm. Uh, Ruth Pitter has a lovely, a forgotten English poet, but she has a lovely introduction to her collected poems where she says that a poet ought to get rid of all obscurities in the work and make it as clear as possible, but some obscurities are actually inherent to the work. and. Uh, if you've done all you can to get rid of them, then it, sometimes a, a certain grace may descend and make them essential to the work, the obscurities themselves, and which is a good way of thinking about reading somebody like Wallace Stevens or Hart Crane, or those modernists. With some some of their obscurities, they could have worked a lot harder. <laughs> but, but there are poems that I love that have things that I don't understand in them, and and uh, and so I think of that as helpful. That Ruth Pitter phrase, some. Some um, some bits of roughness or obscurity or unfinished quality uh, ought not to be worked out of a poem. Sometimes. Last question, because we've we've done an hour, and I don't want to, as you know, take up too much of anyone's time. <laughs> Poet, you had to come around on. You mentioned in a previous book coming the late. Wallace Stevens, appreciating the later stuff in a way you hadn't previously, but but poet, you just didn't get, even in your, your we'll say, adult life, who late in life you've come to. Um, actually, I would say Amakai. I mean, yeah. I, I, when I was young, I couldn't read Amakai because there's no sound there. And uh, I just couldn't read anything that didn't have a signature sound to it, which means very little in translation, because that's usually what gets lost. Yeah. And um, and he's probably become the most important poet of my later life, um, which is odd for me because I'm so sonically uh, driven. But he just has such a gift with metaphor. It's just incredible. It's like Shakespeare. He can take. Uh, concrete things and turn them into abstractions, make them illuminate abstract thought uh, that in ways that I just, I'm just amazed by. Um, so that's somebody that I've definitely come around to. A lot of poetry and translation is like that. He's the main one. But there are all kinds of other poets that I couldn't read when I was young, like Zbigniew Herbert, that I, I like a lot now. Actually, as you do the real last question, since we are surrounded by your, your books, what are you reading? Uh, well, I met, I met my friend um, in New York the other day that I haven't seen in a long time, and we were, we had a conversation about Tom Gunn, because we both used to live right around the corner from Tom, and so he was in our lives. And um, and I, don't, I have some resistance to Gunn's work, and 
that's when it's sort of gone the other way. I loved it when I was young, and now... I, yeah, I didn't want to ask I, it in case it was throwing somebody under the bus, but we can go with that flip side yeah. question. Who did you love that you just, boy, I was young. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved him when I was young, and now I, I find him hard to read. Um, his work feels mechanical to me and a little fussy, um, formally, and and I don't, I don't think his ear is great. Um, but after my conversation with my friend, I came back. So I've been reading some of those poems and going to the ones that my friend mentioned, and and uh, and I'm finding things there. I can see what what I responded to earlier, and I think I was too quick to change my mind on him. Mm -hmm. So I've been reading that, and then I was teaching this fiction class. So this semester, so I've just been reading tons of short stories. Mostly, we read a couple novels, but mostly short stories. So all kinds of short stories, which I never read, and that's one of the reasons, that's the reason I wanted to teach the class, is because just to reacclimate yourself, force myself to read a tons of th ton of things and see what I liked, and yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've been reading a lot of different short stories, and the ones I loved were um, um, Joy Williams, familiar people, Tobias Wolf, um, Deborah Eisenberg. Uh, well, there was one by Alice Monroe. I don't usually love Alice Monroe, but there was one by her that I, I liked quite a bit called The Age of Faith. Yeah, I think you mentioned her in another book. Uh, in that one, yeah. Yeah, in here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I apologize again because it's, it's blending three books of three different periods of your life together. Like I can't believe you read three books, man. Well, you know, I like to do some prep and, yeah. and actually get to know someone, especially with, well, to get back to the, the voice you bring to, to this book in particular. It's a thoughtful, considerate voice about art and faith and living in the world and dying in the world. And these are all things that, you know, in my 50s, I'm finding much more resonance right. with. Right. <laughs> so I'm very thankful to, uh, you know, begin to have this book and to have the time with you like this. Yeah, your needs change as you get older. You become a different kind of reader. When I was young, I was just uh, so taken by any kind of... Um, any kind of excellence in writing or any kind of flashiness or uh, uh, even exhibitionism. I just love the expression of just pure talent. And and now I just don't care about that at all. It's got to it's gotta really be rooted in the real world and have something to say. Um, I'm much more moved. That's part of why I can read Amakai now the way that I do. I'm going to have to stop at a Barnes & Noble on the way home and pick up. Do you have a recommendation or is there a collective? For Amakai? Yeah. There's a, well, your best option is this selected that University of California did, but uh, translated by Hannah Block and Stephen Mitchell and uh, Hannah Kornfeld. But um, Robert Alter has a, you won't find that edition. Robert Alter has a selected poems that's very available. He's not as good a translator as those I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so that one has some weaknesses, but Amakai survives all kinds of translations. It's still a great book. Uh, I might actually have an extra copy. I've noticed we've got copies of Amakai floating around here. Trust me, I have stacks of books that I'd like to give out to people because I'll have nothing to talk about with them otherwise, but I figured I'd, I'd save you from any of those on the, the, the trip. But... <laughs> Well, we'll take a look in your shelves and, and pick something up. But meanwhile, I want to thank you so much for, for the time and for for this book and for the, the work you've done. Um, it has been meaningful for me, Christian. Thanks for having me on, Gil. Nice to be here. And that was Christian Wyman. His new book is Zero at the Bone, 50 Entries Against Despair from FSG. And as you can tell, I loved it. Got a lot out of it. Um, I haven't read any books that are just Christian's poetry, but I did read two of his other memoir slash essay-ish books, uh, My Bright Abyss and He Held Radical Light, and recommend the heck out of both of those. He Held Radical Light is short, like 115 pages or so. A lot of poets name droppy, but, you know, in really good ways uh, in terms of anecdotes and uh, examples of their poetry and, and what their lives meant. 
anyway, the experience of reading those three books in short order has kind of reframed me. So um, I hope maybe they'll they'll change the way you look at the world and, and, and your place in it, too. And as befits somebody who cares about um, higher things, uh, Christian is not active on social media, so don't look him up on Twitter or Instagram or anything. Do look him up online. Uh, Wyman is W-I-M-A-N, by the way. And go read some of his, his poems, essays, interviews. Um, you'll, well, maybe you'll get some of the experience I did. I also ordered that uh, Yehuda Amachai book when I, uh, when I got home. Now, you can support the Virtual memory Show by telling other people about it. Let them know there's this podcast comes out every week with this host who has existential issues that he inflicts on his guests. And I mean, uh, who who puts out fantastic conversations with really interesting, creative people every week. Um, you can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it, uh, who you'd like to hear me record with, or what movie or TV show or book or music or poem or piece of theater or art exhibition or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. You can do that through uh, letters, postcards, my mailing address is at the end of my uh, twice a week Substack, or uh, email, DM if we're connected on social media, although that's pretty rare now, um, or by leaving a message on my Google voice number, which is 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me, and messages can be up to three minutes long, so if you go longer than that, just call back, leave a second message. And let me know if it would be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. Uh, you might have something interesting to share with listeners, but I would never run something like that without the speaker's permission. So let me know. Now, if you got money to spare, don't give it to me. I mean, I got the Patreon. The Substack has a paid tier, although there is no pay-only content. Uh, it's vmspod.substack.com. Go subscribe free if you haven't already. Um, but give money to other people. Help people. Um, you, you can help individuals or institutions with, with people. You start with uh, GoFundMe or Patreon or Kickstarter, or Indiegogo or Crowdfunder, one of those crowdfunding platforms. And you'll probably find people who need help with medical bills or rent or veterinary bills uh, or getting an artistic project off the ground or, or getting car payments so they can get to their job. Um, there are things you can do for, for people. With institutions, I give to my local food bank every month, uh, occasionally give to the Poor People's Campaign, uh, Freedom Funds, Election Funds. I make targeted election contributions because I'm a lobbyist and that's part of what I do. Um, but there are all sorts of things you can do if you've got some money to spare that will help us build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading. Keep making art and keep the conversation going. 